Good afternoon everyone and welcome to this webinar about the Marius Godowski Curie Individual Fellowships Call for 2016. My name is Jennifer Brennan and I'm working here at the Irish Universities Association in Dublin and I'm the National Contact Point and National Delegate for the Marius Godowski Curie Action. During the webinar if you have any questions uh, please email them through to mariecurie at iua.ie after the webinar, a couple of days later, we will publish um, the presentation slides, um, a report of the questions and answers, and also some various supporting documents that you can use to prepare your presentation. I'm going to start off just by introducing the Irish Marius Godowska Curie Office, which is based here at the IUA and sponsored by the Irish Research Council. We have three main functions to promote the actions to Irish researchers and research organisations to support researchers in preparing their funding applications and to contribute to the development of the Marius Godowska Curie Actions. We currently have three persons working in the office, myself as National Contact Point and National Delegate, my colleague Suzanne miller Delaney, who is the Programme Officer for Marius Godowska Curie for the SFI funded research centres, and my colleague Grace McCarthy, who works for us part time as a research officer supporting Marius Godowska Curie Actions and your access. Our office can help you really with two things, that's uh, in being well informed about the programme, so we have various channels for this, an email distribution list which you can join by emailing mariecurie at iua.ie. We have a LinkedIn group, we have a dedicated website, we have a YouTube channel and we also have Twitter, you can find us at at mariescurie underscore IRE. In terms of support, we do training webinars like this one and we provide supporting documents. We'll give you advice on whether you are eligible or what you're thinking about and um, fits the idea for the call. And we also offer a series of proposal writing workshops for individual fellowship. And you can find the link to those and how to register and participate at the uh, hyperlink on the slide there. Mars Godowska Curie Actions then is obviously part of the big Horizon 2020 EU Research and Innovation Funding. It has a 6.2 billion euro budget and it's in the Excellent Science Pillar. It funds all research areas, so we have no thematic calls, we have no priority areas, we will fund absolutely all kinds of research. We implement this by annual calls for proposals. Mars Godowska Curie actions are a little bit different from the rest of Horizon 2020. Um, because they don't focus so much on the research work that's to be done, although of course that has to be good, they focus more on the researchers that take part in the actions and the benefits to their training, to their career development, and to their mobility, and their mobility between different countries and also mobility between different sectors of the economy. So these are the five Marius Godowska Curie actions, RISE Research and Innovation Staff Exchange, ITN Innovative Training Networks, CoFund and European Researchers Night. Finally we have individual fellowships which is the focus of today's webinar. If you're interested in the other programmes and finding out more, you can visit our website uh, where you can go through a link um, and there's a page for each funding call which summarises what it's about. So individual fellowships are a personal fellowship to support a period of mobility. They're open to anyone who at the call deadline is what's called an experienced researcher. And that might be a little different from what you might think an experienced researcher means. In the point of view of Marie Curie, it means somebody who either has a PhD degree or has four years of full-time equivalent research experience, so it could be eight years part-time experience, after their undergraduate degree. There is no age limits in this program and there's no upper experience limit either. The fellowships are fully funded, salary, research costs, etc. are covered. And for this you can choose either an academic host organisation like a higher education institution, a public research organisation like Chagask, or you can choose a non-academic host organisation and this year we have a special offering called the Society and Enterprise Panel um, which promotes choosing the non-academic sector as your host organisation. So we broadly have two kinds of individual fellowship, the European Fellowship and the Global Fellowship. The European Fellowships offer the opportunity for any researcher anywhere in the world to undertake a fellowship at a European research performing organisation. Now when we say Europe in the context of these programmes, we mean the 28 EU member states plus the associated countries, countries which have pretty much bought into Horizon 2020, places like Norway and Turkey and more recently Armenia. We then have the Global Fellowships which is slightly different and that's for people who are already in Europe 
who would like to spend time outside Europe. Um, unsurprisingly, the USA is the most popular destination for this program. With this particular fellowship, you get funded for uh, up to three years. You can spend two to three years outside of the Europe, and then you get a fully funded return year at the end back in a European organization of your choice, and that can be where you already work. The European fellowships last for anything between 12 and 24 months. For the European Fellowship, we have four panels which you can apply to depending on your situation. We have the Standard European Fellowship, which is for researchers who are coming to or moving within Europe. The mobility rule for this programme, and this is a mobility programme, so there is a mobility rule, is that you can only apply with a host in a country where you've lived for no more than 12 months in the three years before the call deadline. So what you need to do is look at where you have lived in the three years between the 15th of September 2013 and the 14th of September 2016 and see whether you have been in particular countries for more than 12 months. If you've recently moved to Ireland, say in the last 10 months or so, you may actually be eligible to apply for this standard European fellowship to remain in Ireland even though you're already in the country. However, if you've been working in Ireland for a long time, to apply for the standard European fellowship you would need to choose another country in Europe. The second option is Career Restart, and that's the same for people coming to or moving within Europe. But this is open to people who have taken a career break, for any reason at all, for at least 12 months before the call deadline. And in this case, they relax the mobility rule. So you can only apply with the host in a country where you've lived for no more than three years in the five years before the call deadline. Then we have the reintegration panel. And that's for people who have, would like to, or have recently relocated to Europe from outside. So imagine if you did your PhD here in Ireland, and then you moved to Australia for a postdoctoral fellowship for two years, and you would like to come back to Ireland, or you've come back in the last year or so. You could apply for this reintegration panel in order to stay here. In order to be eligible for this one, you must be a European citizen or a previous long-term resident. So you have done at least five years of research work in Europe before you went away. So in the example I gave of the researcher who did their PhD in Ireland, imagine that researcher is originally from China and doesn't have Irish residency or um, nationality. That person would need to be able to show that they had been at least five years in Ireland or additionally in another European country before they went away to Australia for that postdoctoral experience. And in this case, the mobility rule is relaxed as well. So again, it's no more than three years in the five years before the call deadline in the host country. The final option is one that's very new and very exciting for us. And this is the new society and enterprise panel. And this again is for people who are coming to or moving within Europe. But in this case, the host must be a non-academic organization. So it can't be a university, an institute of technology, a public research organization. It must be a company, a third sector organisation such as an NGO, a voluntary organisation, a charity, a library, perhaps a national archive, even a museum, a theatre, um, anything that's essentially not an academic organisation. Um, and in this case you can only apply again in a country where you have lived for no more than three years in the five years before the call deadline. This particular new panel is a pilot that will be run for at least two years this year and next year and they have dedicated 10 million euro towards this. Um, 10 million in 2014 and 10 million in 2017, sorry 2016 and 10 million in 2017 and um, they'll probably award in and around 50 to 60 fellowships in this particular panel. If we look now at the global fellowship, this is again for people who are already in Europe who would like to go outside and come back into Europe at the end. So in order to be eligible for this one you must be a European citizen or a long-term resident. So you have to show that you've done consecutively five years or more of research work in Europe before the call deadline. In this case, you can only apply with a host in a non-European country where you've lived for no more than 12 months in the three years before the call deadline. So imagine if you have been working in Ireland for five or six years now, you would really like to go to Japan for your fellowship and come back to Ireland. As long as you can show that you haven't been in Japan for more than 12 months in the three years before the call deadline, it doesn't matter that you've been in Ireland for five or six years. So the mobility rule is around the outgoing country, the country outside Europe. So what's very important to realise is that you can only submit one application per call. You can't apply for European Fellowship and Global Fellowship at the same call. 
you may find that you are eligible for more than one of the European Fellowship Panels, so the Standard Fellowship, the Career, in Career Story Start Panel or the Reintegration Fellowship. In that case, you should pick the one that most closely matches your particular situation. I would always say to you, if you are eligible for the Career Restart and Standard, you should apply for the Career Restart because then you will be compared with re other researchers who have taken a break. If you go into the Standard one, you'll be compared with researchers who haven't had a break in their track record. Another aspect that you can build into your fellowship is this idea of a secondment. So during the individual fellowship, you can be seconded to any host organisation in Europe that you like. Um, ideally, this should take place in a different sector. So if your main host is a university, ideally you should go to perhaps industry or an NGO, something like that. If you're doing the Society and Enterprise Fellowship, your main host is non-academic, and so perhaps you could consider linking with an academic organisation. Um, that organisation can be in the same country as your main fellowship, the same European country, or it can be in a different country. Um, if your fellowship is up to 18 months long, you're allowed to go away for a maximum of three months on a secondment, and if it's over 18 months, you can go for up to six months. And you can split it into several shorter periods, you don't have to go for six months in a block. Um, what's important to note in terms of the application is, in order to fulfil some kind of legal requirements, if you're not sure at the time of application uh, where exactly your secondment will be, you should write in the form that you will go on secondment, uh, give a rough estimate of the time period and state which sector you will go to. And that's just so that if you do decide to go on secondment in the future, there won't be any problems with the project officer in Brussels allowing you to do so. So the very important thing to realise about Marius Godoscu Curie Fellowships is that this isn't really funding for a research project. It's more than that. It's a career development fellowship. And it should involve the following elements. Training through research through an individual project that the researcher will carry out, working in collaboration, of course, uh, with their supervisor and with the organisation they're working in. It also should involve learning new scientific skills, also developing transferable skills, things like communication skills, project management, intellectual property and entrepreneurship. It should ideally involve intersectoral transfer of knowledge or interdisciplinary actions as well. So if you're doing a society and enterprise fellowship, you might want to link in with an academic organisation. If you're doing an academic fellowship, you might want to link in with a non-academic organisation through secondments or also perhaps even just collaborating with an organisation on a project. It should also involve things like taking part in events and organising events, including events designed to promote your fellowship work to the general public, not just to other researchers. And also some hot topics that you can include are things like training in gender, ethics issues and research integrity. The whole thing must be managed by a career development plan and you must outline in the application the details of how you will use this career development plan. We're always quite surprised at how many people don't mention a career development plan in their application. And the reason for our surprise is because this is clearly written in the legal documents for the programme. So in the work programme, which outlines all of the new programmes, actions, rules and regulations for Marius Godoska Curie, it specifically says that in individual fellowships, a career development plan should be established jointly by the supervisor and the researcher. In addition to researcher innovation objectives, this plan comprises the researcher's training and career needs, including training on transferable skills, planning for publications and participation in conferences. And these are just examples. Obviously, if you're doing a society and enterprise fellowship where it's more innovation aspects, you wouldn't necessarily be publishing or going to conferences. So just to say you don't include a career development plan in the application, but you do describe how it will be used during the fellowship to monitor the progress of the research, training and all other fellowship activities. And as we move into the section about how to write a good proposal, we'll talk more and you'll see references to the career development plan throughout. So why is Marius Godoska Curie so interested in your career development plans? Well, the key reasons for this is that there are a lot of people who are moving into a research career now and doing a PhD, but we know that they will not all end up in academia. And as this graph here was prepared from a Royal Society document, I cut and pasted it from it, which shows the um, career paths of researchers who graduate with a PhD in the UK. And you can see that roughly less than 10% end up as permanent research staff in a university setting, and less than 2% will end up being a professor. So the Marius Godoska Curie Actions is really about preparing researchers for careers in a range of sectors, um, increasingly in the private sector or the non-academic sector outside of academia. 
just to look briefly at the model. So there are two categories of costs. There's the cost for the researcher, then there's the institutional costs. To deal with the cost for the researcher first, because I think most people are interested in what they're going to get paid. Um, the fellow's salary consists of the living allowance, mobility allowance, and if eligible, a family allowance. A family allowance is paid to those who, when they submit the application, are married or in a civil or a legal partnership and, uh, or, and or have dependent children. Um, however, the rates in the table are inclusive of all the employer's costs of recruiting you. So in Ireland, that's employers pay related social insurance, social security contributions and a pension contribution typically. And so these are basically cut off the top of these rates before you're paid them. And actually, just to mention, sorry, the rates in the table are per month. A country coefficient applies to the living allowance. So for Ireland, um, the coefficient is, is more than one because um, Ireland has quite a high cost of living. But for a country like Romania, it's significantly lower. So in Ireland, the estimated gross salary prior to paying your own tax, social security and pension would be around €55,000 per annum if you weren't eligible for the family allowance and about £60,000 per annum if you were, well eligi were eligible for the family allowance. The institutional costs then are €800 Euro a month to cover the cost of the research, any training and also networking like going to conferences. The management and indirect costs for the programme are about €650 Euro a month and this is given to the host organisation to help them manage the cost of hosting your fellowship. Let's look now in a little bit of detail about how to apply for a fellowship. So if you're interested in applying for a European fellowship, you first of all need to find a European host organisation and a supervisor at that host organisation who will support your application. You submit the application with them if you are successful, that host signs a contract with the European Commission and then they hire you as a researcher, pay you your salary, make available your research costs, etc. If you're going for the Global Fellowship, you, re you reapply with a European host and supported by a non-European host who give you a letter of commitment that you put into the application. The European host organisation, again, if you are successful, signs a contract with the European Commission and the non-European host tends to sign a partnership agreement with the European host that governs things like budgetary issues, intellectual property, etc. The European host then employs the researcher and then you would be seconded out to the non-European host organisation. So for the first two years of the fellowship, um, you'll be seconded out to, for example, the USA, but you'll continue to be employed by the European, say, for example, the Irish host organisation, um, and then obviously when you come back to Ireland, if you come back to Ireland, you will be hosted by, or employed by them too. The reason for this is to ensure that you don't have a break in your social security coverage. Um, the Commission wouldn't want you to be disadvantaged because you had left Ireland for two years in order to undertake this fellowship or left Europe for two years to undertake this fellowship. The whole thing is an online application and at the bottom of the slide there you can find the link where you can access the application system. So. The first thing that you have to do is complete a set of administrative forms and set up your proposal. Um, you need to go to the call page on the participant portal. I have given you the link to the bottom there. Um, you need to create something called an ECAS account if you don't already have one and you log in. In order to set up the application, you need to get the participant identification code of your host organization um, and put that into the system. Now you can search for those, but sometimes there are more than one for an organization. Please don't create a new one for an organisation. Um, you're not legally supposed to do that, although technically you can. Um, if you aren't sure, contact your host organisation and find out what their pick is before you put it in. It's very important to note that the call deadlines are Brussels times. So if it's a five o'clock deadline, that means it's a four o'clock deadline in Ireland. The second part of the application is what we call the Part B, and that's really the proposal itself. Um, what you do is when you're in the online system and you've set up the proposal, you download the template from inside the online system. You complete that template, it's in rich text format, you can complete it in something like Microsoft Word or OpenOffice or Latex, and you save it then as a PDF document. You then upload it into the online system and submit the whole thing, part A and part B as a package. Now, you can submit as many times as you like and the new submission overwrites the previous submission. So we always say submit early and often. Please be aware that the system slows down considerably in the two days prior to the deadline. So it's always a really good idea to put in a kind of a first final draft about three or four days before the actual deadline itself. 
If we look now at the content of the part B, the actual proposal itself, there are two bits, part B1 and part B2. Part B1 is a maximum of 13 pages long. You have one page for a standard start page, which is in the template and you fill it out. One page for a table of contents, and please use a proper table of contents with all the sections broken down. There is one in the application form, but it literally just has three headings, so please break it down into subheadings. There's also a page for a list of the participants, and that's the participating organisations, not the researcher. Your details go in the administrative forms in Part A. Then there are three sections, Excellence section, Impact section, and Implementation section. And the Implementation section includes a Gantt chart to show timelines. For these, you have a maximum of 10 pages total. There are no individual page limits for the individual sections. You decide yourself how you want to break it down. Just to let you know that the evaluators will disregard any excess pages above the 13 page limit. So if you write 14 pages, page number 14 will not be taken into account in the evaluation. It will be watermarked as an extra page to signal that to the evaluators and they aren't allowed to take it into account. So there's no point in writing more than 13 pages because they simply will ignore it. The second part then is part B2, which has no overall page limit. And this is section four, the CV of the experienced researcher, and you have five pages for that. Section five is about um, a table that you fill out for each organization participating in your fellowship. And um, it's one table per organization. There's finally a section six on ethical aspects, which um, you have as much space to write about as you like. And then section seven for letters of commitment. And we'll deal with all these various different elements from section one through to section seven in the rest of the um, presentation. Now let's look briefly at the evaluation process. So the Myers Kodosk Curie Actions uses eight different scientific panels for evaluation. So if you are a chemistry researcher and you submit your proposal to the chemistry panel, it's only going to be read by chemistry experts. So when you set up your proposal in the online system, you must choose to submit it with one of these evaluation panels. Now, if your proposal is interdisciplinary in any way, I can tell you on the next slide about how to deal with that. After you choose your scientific panel, you then can add up to five, minimum three, descriptors from a standard list which is provided in the application. The list of descriptors is given at the back of the guide for applicants if you would like to have a look at it. You must choose your first and second descriptor from your scientific panel. So if you choose the chemistry panel, then you must choose your first and second descriptor from the chemistry panel. The third descriptor, and fourth and fifth if you like, can be chosen from any of the eight scientific panels. So if your, pres your proposal is interdisciplinary between chemistry and say environment and geosciences, you can choose two chemistry descriptors and then three and possibly four and five um, from the environment panel. And these will help with matching your proposal to evaluators with expro appropriate expertise. The evaluation criteria are as follows. There's the excellence section gets 50% of the marks, the impact section is 30% and the implementation is 20%. The overall threshold of, to be included in the ranking list is 70%, but the cutoff score for the actual funded proposals is much higher. So in 2015, the median cutoff score for European fellowship, it was 91.1% and for Global Fellowship was 93.7%. So you can see that you really have to get an almost perfect score in order to be funded in this programme. So here's the table of the full sub-criteria under those main criteria. Now I'm not going to go through this in detail, but it encompasses in the Axon section, quality of the research, quality of the training, quality of the supervision, and the quality of the researcher. For impact, it's about enhancing the career prospects of the researcher, and the quality of your measures to exploit, disseminate, and communicate the project results. For implementation, it's about a work plan, tasks and resources, management structures, and the institutional environment. The proposal template matches this table precisely, and you should follow the template when preparing your application. 
So one very important thing to be aware of um, in relation to the evaluation criteria is a European policy document called the Charter and Code, which has been mainstreamed throughout the Marius Godos Security Actions, including the evaluation criteria. The Charter and Code was published uh, about 10 years ago now, and it talks about researchers' career management and also open and transparent recruitment and appraisal. If you are going to apply with a host institution that has written a letter to the Commission to endorse the Charter and Code, you should include this in the proposal. And I've given you the web link where you can find the list of organisations that have done so. As a follow on to this then, the Commission decided to try and encourage organisations to align their policies for researchers with the Charter and Code. And so they complete an exercise including a gap analysis and an action plan which gives them this award of this hate or excellence and research logo that they're allowed to use. Uh, many Irish higher education institutions are awardees of the hate or excellence logo and you can find a list at that web link provided. And again, if applicable, you should include this in the proposal. So the individual fellowships call for 2016 is open now and it closes at uh, 4 o'clock Irish time on the 14th September 2016. You'll get the results in February 2017 and you can start the fellowship in May 2017 or you can defer it for up to 18 months. In terms of the success rates across Europe, global fellowships around 11% were funded of applications and around 14% for European fellowship. Ireland did a little bit better than those success rates last year, so people who were applying with Ireland as their host organisation, um, about 17% of applications were funded, both for global fellowship and for European fellowship. So now we get onto the meat of this uh, webinar, which is writing a good proposal. And this comes from advice that we have gleaned from people who have evaluated from these programs in the past, from our own experience of helping applicants put proposals together, and also from the Net for Mobility Network of Marius Godoska Curie Actions NCPs based all around the world. So some general points to keep in mind. It's very important to use a self-explanatory title with minimum scientific jargon and a memorable acronym. It's always good to use a real word, a clever word, that maybe links to the research somehow. It's very important because you have a quite small amount of space for this particular proposal to try and use as much as possible diagrams, charts, tables or figures. They can be easy to evaluate for the evaluators and they can save space as well. You are allowed to decrease the font size in tables um, so you can, they're not too small obviously it has to be readable, but you can decrease it down from the minimum that's specified in the guide for applicants which I think is 11 points. If you are someone who has submitted last year or the year before and is resubmitting, um, it's very important that you don't just use the evaluation summary report from the previous submission to help you revise. So have a look at the proposal, make sure the state of the art is up to date and see if you can improve the entire thing. Um, the reason for this, of course, is that the standard goes up every year. Your proposal is not being compared with last year's proposal. They're not going to look at it and say, oh, this is better than last year, so therefore we will fund it. It's not. You're being evaluated in comparison with the other applications submitted in the 2016 call. Um, the evaluators will have access to the evaluation summary report from last year's application to check things, but they are not required to take on board what's written in that evaluation summary report if they don't want to. The final thing is, of course, to be aware of the overall weighting of each of the evaluation criteria and sub-criterion. You need to score well in all sections in order to be funded. If you spend all your time refining the research work, you really will probably only get a few marks because the research section is only worth 12.5% of the marks. So you need to pay attention to every single aspect of the application and fill every single section out correctly. So these uh, tables here show us some tips for laying out the proposal correctly. So these are not necessarily things that are evaluated, but things that make life easier for the evaluators. So we refer to the template, we refer to the formatting and also the language. Just two things to highlight. Common questions that we get are, how do I include literature references? So it is written in the guide for applicants, but people seem to miss it for some reason. So literature references should be in footnotes, so they do count towards the 10 page limit, and they should be in font size 8 or 9. In terms of language, um, when talking about yourself, as in the applicant, you can use either the first person, like I, me, we, or the third person, the researcher, the host organisation, the supervisor. Um, you can use either, depending on what you prefer yourself, but please be consistent. 
Another important aspect in Horizon 2020 is the area of gender, which is a cross-cutting issue across the programme. And so you'll see that for the first time in 2016, gender is explicitly mentioned in the evaluation sub-criteria for research and training for all Myers Godosco Curie actions. So in your proposal, where requested, make sure that you describe any gendered innovations, any gender training, and any gender balance issues. Now, gender balance is probably not so relevant to an individual fellowship application as it would be in a large consortium application. Gendered innovations are really any gender and sex differences that could come to, into play in the performance of the research, dissemination of the research, outcomes of the research, um, depending on whether it's male or female. Um, a good example of this is um, crash test dummies, which for many years were based on the male body type and male body weight. Um, which meant, of course, they weren't really suitable for testing things like airbags um, with respect to women, particularly women who are smaller, and also pregnant women who have a completely different shape. And so that's obviously a failure to take into account gender and sex differences. So you can use the links that we provided on the screen there, the Gendered Innovations website and the Yellow Window um, Gender and Research Toolkit to identify whether there could be any gender issues in relation to your research. And, and you would be surprised at how actually it can come into play, even when we don't think that there possibly could be. You should write this in the section on the research about how gender is relevant. And even if it's not relevant, you should include one sentence to say that you have looked at gendered innovations in relation to the research and basically determined that it's not relevant. In terms of gender training, um, in your training program, in the fellowship application, you can specify that you will get training in gendered issues, gender issues or gendered innovations, which may be useful for your future career. One important thing to notice is, again, similar to the HR Excellence in Research logo, Ireland uh, last year signed up to the Athena Swan Gender Equality Charter, and Irish organisations have been applying for the Gender Equality Charter mark from Athena Swan. And so far, Trinity College Dublin and University of Limerick have actually secured those awards. It doesn't mean that everything is perfect in terms of equality and diversity in those institutions, but it means that they have a plan to try and fix things and make things better. So you can, again can include this in the application in the context of gender. So let's have a look now in more detail on the excellence section of the proposal, which is broken down into four sections. The first part is called the quality and credibility of the research and innovation action. So what's important to note is that even though the Commission will do their best to match your proposal with experts in your field, not everybody who does your evaluation, there will be three people who will evaluate your application, will be a complete expert in your area. So make sure that you write in a style that's accessible to the non-expert and again try to use figures and charts and tables to illustrate concepts um, where appropriate. It's very important to have a clear set of research objectives or questions or a hypothesis that you're going to test. Be very clear about what they are and make them very upfront in the proposal. State really at the earliest point what it is you're trying to achieve. Make sure that they, of course they are related to the state of the art and that the state of the art is up to date, particularly if you're resubmitting. And you should include a list of references. And as I said before, this should be in footnotes. Now you don't have a lot of space here. So please try to keep your references to a minimum. Maybe use review articles, book chapters, etc. Um, instead of list, long, long, long lists of individual articles. Here's our suggested structure for writing section 1.1. So we suggest that you should start the entire fellowship application with one paragraph, kind of like an application, that describes the overall application the general research area, who the host organisations are, who the supervisors are, and brief information on secondments that if you're going to do if appropriate. Outline your research objectives that you're going to explore during the research, your questions or your hypothesis. Describe the state of the art and how they relate to it. Then describe in detail how you will explore those objectives or questions or test your hypothesis in your research programme. And that's the methodology section. It's a really good idea with these programs to break up the work into discrete blocks, which we call work packages. And we'll talk more about that later. And that's simply kind of breaking the research down into smaller chunks that you can do. It's very important to explain why all this is original, innovative, novel and timely compared to the state of the art. And you need to state this very clearly and explicitly, particularly for evaluators who are not from your field, who may not immediately understand that this is a new thing. You need to really explain why. In this section, you should also include any reference to gender aspects in the research, if appropriate. 
Make sure you explain how the research is interdisciplinary, if that's the case. And finally, and something people leave out quite a lot, and it is required in the application form, explain how this research programme will be good for your career and how it will open up new collaborations for the host organisation. So you may be planning on moving to a new country, you may have recently moved to Ireland and are planning to apply for a fellowship here. Um, you obviously have probably have previous connections um, in your research area and maybe you could bring those with you and form a collaboration with your new host organisation. Looking now at section 1.2, which is about quality of training and transfer of knowledge. The proposal template refers to a two-way transfer of knowledge. So what that means is they expect to see a transfer of knowledge from the host organisation to the researcher via training and from the researcher to the host organisation, which we call transfer of knowledge. I'll explain this a little more as we move in. So looking at training, first of all. So you need to basically write a training plan in your application. So what's really good in terms of writing a training plan is, first of all, to carry out a skills audit. So think about what your future career goals are. They can be short, medium, long-term career goals. And what skills you need to develop or build on in order to get you towards those goals. Once you've identified those skills, devise a short list of training objectives from the results of the skills audit and include this list at the start of the section. You know, again, like you have your research objectives, you've also got your training objectives. And then describe a training plan to acquire those skills during the fellowship. And this needs to be a very specific training plan, not something quite vague. Clearly describe what you're trying to achieve and how you're going to achieve it. So what training are you going to get? When are you going to get it? What are you going to get it for? Why are you developing it? You must schedule all of your training and you can use the mandatory Gantt chart in section three to do that. It must include the preparation and use of a career development plan. So you must state that at the outset of the program, you and your supervisor or supervisors will define a career development plan with research and innovation objectives and also other training objectives, transfer of knowledge objectives, attending conferences, um, other dissemination work, exploitation of the research, whatever it is that you plan to do. Um, if you're going to go on to comment or you're going to collaborate with um, other sectors, um, then you should be very specific about that, again included in the Gantt chart and say why. If your host organisation has a staff development programme of some kind, then make sure that you mention that they have this and then explain which bits of it you're going to use in your personal training plan. If you're working in an organisation that doesn't have a staff development programme, you may need to look to see are there any external training providers that you can link in with and uh, find out the details of where, for example, you might be able to do project management training if your host organisation doesn't have a programme like that. So when thinking about training, they expect to see you planning to acquire three different kinds of skills. So research skills, which are core to the research project that you will do additional research skills, um, then also transferable and complementary skills. So skills that might be useful in academic careers, if you're going to an academic institution and you plan an academic career, uh, but also skills that may be useful in non-academic careers. So communication skills are always useful no matter where you work. Project management skills are always useful, for example. Um, if you really are keen on um, spinning out or starting your own company working in industry, you probably should include courses in things like entrepreneurship, intellectual property management, etc. Now, nobody expects you to spend all your time going on training courses. So some of these can be acquired on the job simply through doing the work of the fellowship, and some of them can be acquired through training courses. A very useful resource for doing your skills audit and identifying and putting together your training plan is a thing called the Vitae Researcher Development Framework, which was produced by an in the UK called the Careers Research and Advisory Centre. Now this is copyright to Vitae, but you are allowed to use it as long as I acknowledge the copyright. You can find this online. It's very useful. It was created with researchers and it identifies four main domains of skills that researchers need to uh, build up. And as you can see around the outside of the wheel, a whole set of skills that researchers um, need to uh, develop or could consider developing. And so you can kind of use this as a shopping list to identify what skills you need to develop and then figure out how you're going to develop those skills during the fellowship. The transfer of knowledge section is slightly different. So this is about the knowledge that you already have that you will transfer to your host organisation. If you're already at your host organisation, it needs to be how you'll sort of deepen that knowledge transfer. You've probably already started because you've already been working there. 
This is uh, particularly important, of course, for the global fellowships, because, of course, you'll go away for a couple of years, you know, to Japan or whatever, and you'll come back to Europe and you'll have learned the new things in Japan and you might want to bring those back. It's also very important for the reintegration fellowship because then you're bringing back knowledge from outside Europe into Europe. So you should highlight those, particularly if you're doing global fellowship or reintegration panel. But of course, it's important for all the other uh, fellowships as well. So similar to being clear about what your training is going to encompass, you need to be very clear about what knowledge will be transferred. So the simplest way to do this is provide a bulleted list or a table of objectives, tra knowledge transfer objectives, very easy for the evaluators to follow. And then explain how you will transfer it. So in that same table, you could describe the specific measures that you will use to embed this knowledge into the host organization. And you know it doesn't have to be anything particularly creative. It can be things like simply mentoring or working with students or other members of the research team. Um, maybe delivering a seminar, a training workshop, perhaps even attending conferences within Europe in the field, um, building a collaboration between the outgoing host organization and the um, European one for the Global Fellowship. Um, anything that you think of that could be used to transfer the knowledge that you have into the host organization. Um, section 1.3 is about quality of the supervision and integration into the team or host organization. So supervision, it's very important to show that the people that you've chosen to supervise your fellowship have experience of supervising or managing staff members or researchers. So you can include things like current members of their team, how many PhD students they have supervised if it's an academic host, how many staff members they have if it's a non-academic host, um, have they been involved in any other um, research grants at EU level or at national level to do with research training? Um, some of this information you can put in the capacities tables, which is in section 5 of the application. And these are these standard tables where you fill out details of the host organisation. Um, if you are applying for Global Fellowship, of course, you need to put the details of both supervisors. For European Fellowship, it's one. Don't forget that if you're going on to comment, you'll have a supervisor there as well, and you should include their details too. You should also demonstrate that the supervisors are experts in the research area um, or the research innovation area if it's a more innovation type project. You should give details on their achievements in this area. So for academia that can be publications, for a more commercial environment it could be um, patents or new um, products or new processes that are being brought to the market. If it's maybe a more um, non-academic but not industry setting, it could be policy interventions, it could be something that was done to help the community, for example, a research project they participated in that helped their particular um, community clients. If there's going to be other members of the team or of the host organisation that's going to help to co-supervise or mentor the researcher, make sure that you spell out what they're going to do and explain their experience also in the capacities table. You need to really spell out what the supervisor is going to do in the fellowship. So of course, they're going to supervise you, but they're going to help you with every aspect of the fellowship. They're going to monitor your research progress. They're going to assist you with your career development plan, which should monitor all aspects of the fellowship. If you are doing the global fellowship, of course, you've got two supervisors, so you have to explain the role of the two supervisors. Typically, the European supervisor is the one who has the primary responsibility for you. So you have to remember that um, even though you're not going to be in Europe for the first two years of the fellowship, you need to keep that person in the loop. So you maybe need to have sort of tripartite meetings by Skype between you and your European supervisor and your outgoing supervisor as well. There's no room to provide a CV for each of your supervisors, right? So you've got to keep it concise. If we look then at integration, this is about integration in the team and the institution. So you have the opportunity here to outline the quality of the research group or the research environment in the organisation or the quality of the organisation as a whole, if it's a small organisation like you know, a company applying for the Society and Enterprise Panel. Explain very clearly how this new researcher, how this new staff member is going to be integrated into this new environment. And you know that can be quite simple as you know, a welcome package, um, coffee morning, whatever it is that you would do to welcome a new person in, staff induction program, you know, new staff uh, welcome program, etc, etc. You're also specifically asked to explain the networking opportunities offered by the host organisations, the international networking opportunities as well, if they exist. 
And also remember, don't forget the secondment host. If you're going on secondment, you need to think about how they're going to welcome you and settle you into the organisation as well. And the aim here, and it specifically says it in the proposal template, is to show that all parties will gain the maximum benefit from the fellowship. Now we come to section 1.4, <clears throat> which is the capacity of the researcher. So in writing this, you need to think of it as a personal statement. So the overall objective is to show that you have a high potential for a successful research career in the sector of your choice. So I find it's really good to start this out by telling the evaluator what your career goals are. So where do you want to be? Short term, medium term, long term goals. And then explain how your past experience plus getting this fellowship is going to help you to work towards or achieve those goals. You can highlight your major research or innovation achievements. Make sure that you provide evidence of leadership skills and independent thinking. Now these are things that the evaluators are specifically told to look for, although it's not written anywhere in the guide for applicants, which is a bit sneaky, but we know from talking to evaluators that this is what they look for. So show some evidence that you are thinking independently about your work. Maybe you've developed some leadership skills of some kind. Those can be personal leadership skills as well as kind of professional leadership skills. So maybe you're the captain of your local football team or you're the chair of your local committee in volunteering organization. Something that shows that you have the potential to lead. You also should explain the match between your research experience from before and the proposed project that you're going to do and how it's going to add to your experience. If you're moving into a site in your research area, obviously you have to make very clear that you're going to very quickly bridge the gap in order to get the knowledge that you need to effectively implement the fellowship and you should think about this in your training plan you know if there's a real gap between what you've done before and what you're going to do for the fellowship at the very earliest stage of the fellowship you need to be planning some intensive training to help you to bridge that gap you can also here briefly mention how the career development plan will ensure that your goals are achieved um, in terms of your career goals and what you want to try to achieve during the fellowship. You can't put in a letter of reference. If you do, they'll ignore it. So you really have to sell yourself. So this is no time to be sort of shy and retiring. You need to put your absolute best foot forward and write a really strong personal statement. Another thing that they will look at in respect of this section 1.4 is your CV that's in section 4 which is five pages long. Now your CV I guess I suppose is like a list of all of your achievements and your section 1.4 should be about pulling out the most important parts and writing a coherent statement almost like the cover letter that would go with your CV if you were writing a fairly long cover letter for a CV trying to draw the attention of the employer to say oh this person's really great I should actually look at their CV if you're applying for a job it's a kind of that same kind of uh, analogy so use the full five pages some people find it tough to get it into five pages some people actually think that they would be doing well to get five pages um, if you have space, something that you can do is describe your three major research achievements, one paragraph each, encompassing things like what you set out to do, what you achieved and what you learned along the way. It's very important to be able to show that you've already started to develop an excellent track record, which is appropriate to your career stage, your discipline and the sector you've been working in. Now, obviously, the evaluators will expect a lot more from someone who has five years of postdoc experience compared to somebody who has just finished their PhD. So the kind of things you can include in this would be things like publications, conference participation, any um, industrial projects that you've been involved on, any new products that you brought to market, any patents, any trade secrets, monographs, book chapters. If you have publications, you should include bibliographic information, things like impact factor, um, number of citations, for example, um, journal ranking in the field. There is no preferred metrics or bibliographics, so it doesn't matter whether you decide to use Scopus or you decide to use Thomson Reuters, you can basically uh, say which one you're going to use. If you're not the first or the lead author on your publications, make sure that you briefly explain your contribution. I know in some cultures the supervisor is always the first author, but maybe the person reading your application won't know that. So you need to specify that it was the supervisor who was the first author, because that's how things are done, where you did your PhD and um, that basically you did all the work and wrote the drafts, etc., etc. if that is the case. Make sure you include all relevant experience, so any teaching experience, any consultancy, supervision, any events you were involved in, any public outreach you did. Do you do um, reviewing for journals? Were you ever on the organizing board of a conference, for example? Include any kind of awards. Um, don't put in anything that could point you in a negative light, like 
papers that you submitted that weren't uh, weren't accepted or grant applications that you put in that weren't funded, for example, everything has to show you off in a really positive light. Now we have a look at the impact section. So I'm going to start off by showing you what the Marius Kodoska Curie Action expects in terms of impact from these fellowships. And this is specified in the work program that I mentioned earlier. So they're expecting impact at three different levels. At researcher level, getting an increased set of skills, improved employability and career prospects in and out of academia, increase in research and innovation output, more knowledge and ideas being brought closer to the market, and a greater contribution to knowledge-based economy and society. At organisation level, so the host organisations that support you, they're looking to see enhanced cooperation and networking, better transfer of knowledge between different sectors and between different disciplines, and a boosting of research and innovation capacity among the organisations. At system level, as in the research system in Europe, they're expecting to see an increase in mobility of researchers between international, intersectoral, and also mobility between disciplines. They're looking to see Europe's human capital base in research and innovation being stronger with more entrepreneurial and better trained and better qualified researchers. They're looking to see better communication of research and innovation results to society, an increase in Europe's attractiveness as a destination for research and innovation, and better quality research and innovation contributing to Europe's competitiveness and growth. So that's what they're trying to achieve. That's why they are putting you know, millions of euros of EU taxpayers' money into this programme to fund researchers to do their fellowships. So when you're writing the impact section, please try to keep those impacts in mind and try as much as possible to address each of those expected impacts when writing the impact section. And try to be specific. Don't just say, oh, the impact will be blah, blah. It'll be, the impact will be blah, blah, because we will do the following things. Make it specific provide details of how the impact will be achieved. The first section that you have to complete is about enhancing the researcher's career. So that's pretty much explaining the impact of the research and training on your career as the applicant. So what new research skills, what new transferable skills, what deepening of your existing skills are you going to get during the fellowship? How are you going to be collaborating with other sectors through secondments or by working collaboratively with them if appropriate? how it's going to help you to achieve or work towards your career goals, including some mention of what you plan to do immediately after the fellowship and how the fellowship is going to help you to get to that point. It's often good to point to other grants, for example, or that you might apply for um, towards the end of the fellowship. Explain how these new competencies will help the research to have a strong future impact on European society and the economy. So you can talk about how you learning these new skills as a researcher will become a stronger researcher who is better able to do work that benefits European society and economy. And uh, you can link to the importance of the research area here as well. If you're a research area, you can show that it's important to the economy or society. So a bonus points alert. We have developed a research policy brief, which will be available after the webinar which identifies the EU policy documents which are relevant to researcher careers. And we have taken out the most important phrases from those policy documents, and you can use those within your application. However, you need to make a tangible, genuine link between your fellowship plans and those policies. Sometimes people say, oh, this is in line with the Innovation Union Flagship 2020 initiative. How is it in line with the Innovation Union Flagship 2020 initiative? So, Think about making a tangible link, otherwise you're just paying lip service and it doesn't come across as genuine. The second section is dissemination and exploitation. So in terms of dissemination of the work, this is pretty much academic dissemination and perhaps to potential users. So if your work was potentially relevant to, I suppose, patient advocacy groups, how would you communicate with patient advocacy groups about the results of your work? And it's also about promoting to the wider research and innovation community. So other researchers in your field, other researchers more generally, and people who may benefit from your work. So you need to describe precisely what you're going to do to ensure that this particular audience learns about your research activities. So you're probably going to, if you're in an academic setting, want to publish your work. You may want to go to conferences, you may want to organise a workshop or a seminar, perhaps for those patient advocacy groups that I mentioned. You should mention examples of which conferences you might go to. You should target names of particular journals that you're going to do. If your plan is to write a book, you should maybe specify um, who might potentially publish that book for you. You should describe also the potential impact of disseminating to them. 
so when you talk about the activities you could talk about the impact say for example on those patient advocacy groups of you disseminating and talking to them about your research work the second aspect of this is intellectual property rights and exploitation Now, this won't necessarily be relevant for everybody's kind of research area but you can think about how the research results may be useful to business so how are you going to keep an eye out during the fellowship for any potential intellectual property commercial potential arising from the program if you're working in a company environment that's probably something you will do from the outset if you're working in an academic environment it may not be something you think about immediately um, if you're doing the global fellowship you've got two host organizations so how have you decided to arrange the intellectual property you might want to talk to your European host to see how they normally manage this um, with outgoing organisations. If you like, you can have a look at the simplified rules on intellectual property in Marie Curie um, in the leaflet from the IPR help desk. And again, you should describe the potential impact of any exploitation of commercial potential or intellectual property. The second aspect, which may be addition or maybe separate to or um, in place of the business relevance is the relevance to wider society. So again you've got to describe what you're going to do to ensure that relevant societal actors, so community sector, voluntary sector, policy makers etc will benefit from your project. Um, if your research could potentially have an impact on undergraduate teaching but you don't necessarily feel it's relevant to society or relevant to business, you can specify how it would help to improve the quality of undergraduate teaching, for example. It may even have an impact on secondary school level teaching or primary school level teaching. And describe the potential impact of societal expectation of the results. So how will society benefit if you communicate with them about your work? The third part of the impact section is about communication and public engagement. So you may think, well, I'm already doing dissemination and exploitation, so what else do I need to do in terms of communication? Um, but in the context of this program, communication means something slightly different than maybe you would think. So it's very important to say, first of all, that the European Union places great emphasis on communicating research outputs to the public. That's in terms of or the public seeing that it's worthwhile to continue to spend money on research, seeing that the research that's done is a benefit for them, and also encouraging more young people to move into a research career. There's a guidelines document on the Marie Curie Options website which describes the difference between communications and public engagement. So communication to them essentially is media communication. So it's newspaper, magazine articles, TV, radio, something like that. So you can describe how you will try to get media coverage about the activities of the project. Now, most organizations have a communications officer, larger organizations have a communications office um, who would work to do things like press releases, who might try and link you in with TV companies, with local radio, with national radio, with whatever, um, in order to promote your work. And again, you should describe the potential impact of any media coverage, which would essentially be raising awareness about the research and also raising awareness about research as a career. Uh, public engagement is slightly different. It's about engaging with the general public and I suppose doing more demonstration, kind of public lectures, engaging them a little bit more. And you need to plan a few activities that will engage the general public about your research. The easiest way to do this is to join in with local things that are already happening. So here in Ireland we have things like the Pint of Science, we have the SFI Discover programme, we have Researchers Night. And you can talk to people at your institution who were involved in them or outside your institution who involved in them and see can you get involved. So have a look to see what you could join in with. Um, make sure that you describe the potential impact of engaging the public. And again, that's in and around promoting research as being a good thing, raising the awareness about your particular research area, and also um, encouraging younger people to um, become researchers. So some tips. When you get to section 2.2 and 2.3, um, make sure that you include some kind of quantifiable targets for measuring the effectiveness of your dissemination, your exploitation, your communication and public engagement activities. Um, and this can be something as simple as we'll have a website and we'll aim to have like so many visits per week or whatever. It could be you have a Facebook page and you have so many likes of your Facebook page. It could be that you have an event for school children and you try to get at least 50 school children to come to it. Um, you can use social media, of course, and I think it would be if you'd be fooled to leave it out, essentially. They're starting to look for this now. Social media can be used for academic dissemination. It can also be used for communicating with the media and also can be used for outreach, public engagement as well. So you can use it in that way too. So now we'll have a look at section three, the implementation section. 
Section 3.1 focuses on the work plan and what we are recommending is this essentially consists of a Gantt chart and this again is within the page limits. This describes the timing of the proposal activities and the overall work plan. Um, you can use the template that's provided in the application, it's not particularly good. Uh, you can modify it if you like or you can use another template. It's quite easy to mock up a pretty decent Gantt chart using Microsoft Excel or other spreadsheet software as well. Um, you can get some fancy project management software that will do it for you, but I think try to keep it simple. Um, the one that they provide in the application form takes up a whole page of A4. So if I were you, I wouldn't do that. It takes up too much room and only leaves you nine pages for text. So you can squish it down, you can turn it around, you can reorient it so that it fits up um, maybe on a half a page or so of the application instead of a full page. What you need to put in the Gantt chart is the following, typically. Your work package titles. So it's normal to usually have between two and four research work packages. Um, they can run sequentially, one after the other, or concurrently, and they can be interconnected. So in a very simplistic example, imagine you're doing a project, your first work package could be data collection, your second work package could be data analysis. There you've got two work packages. You must include a work package for management, for training and transfer of knowledge, and include, um, later on you can include some of the activities that you have planned in the earlier part of the proposal. You should also include a work package for the dissemination, exploitation, communications and public engagement stuff that you've described in the impact section too. You also are required to include in this deliverables. So deliverables are things that you can kind of physically deliver. And if you are funded, you will be required to actually deliver to the project officer in Brussels anything that you have identified as a deliverable. So this can be something like um, a report, on the completion of various experiments, for example. It could be a document, it could be um, a piece of software, it could be the outcome of a meeting, it could be a prototype, um, it could be, for example, a website. You can't really deliver a website to the project officer, um, but you can send them the link to the website and therefore you've delivered it to them. Uh, milestones you have to include as well, and milestones are slightly different. So milestones are essentially checkpoints or control points um, used to chart the sort of large scale process of the project. So, for example, in that thing we did, said where you had one work package on data collection, you know, completion of all data collection could be a milestone. Completion of all data analysis could be a milestone. Um, the sort of initial creation of your career development plan in month one could be a milestone. The completion of the final version of your career development plan could be a milestone as well. Include the details of your succumbents if you're doing them and anything else that you're going to do. So conferences, workshops, any tasks around dissemination, any public engagement, maybe information on publications that you might plan to produce as well. Section 3.2 talks about the appropriateness of the allocation of tasks and resources. So we're recommending that you use this section to provide a brief description of each of the work packages. So you could maybe use a table for this. It's quite typical to include a short list of tasks which you will undertake in each work package. Um, the management tasks can include things like meetings with your supervisor and the standard reports to the European Union, which would include financial and technical reports at the end of the fellowship. When you're putting in your tasks for dissemination, exploitation, communications and public engagement, make sure that they match what you've written in section two. The same for the training and transfer of knowledge tasks. Whatever you put in the work package tables here should match what you said in section one. Describe how the work packages, the timing of the work packages and the workload will make sense. Um, sometimes people are criticized for planning something that's too ambitious and something that's actually too much workload for one researcher. You also have to explain why the length of the fellowship, they call that the number of person months in the application, is appropriate to complete all of the work foreseen in the work packages. And the aim really is to highlight the strengths and the feasibility of the work plan. Section 3.3 is about the management structure and procedures to be applied to the call. So what you need to do here is explain how the work plan will be managed and monitored. And the main managers and monitors of the fellowship are your supervisor or supervisors. Um, assisted by the various structures on offer within the host organisation and the researcher themselves. The tasks that you would include in the management of it would be things mainly, most importantly, progress monitoring. So research mo monitoring of the progress, the training progress, transfer of knowledge objectives, dissemination, career planning. Explain how the supervisors will help with progress monitoring and remember that you have to do this through the mandatory career development plan and include how often you will meet with them. 
if you're doing a global fellowship you probably have to think a little bit about how you're going to bring in the supervisor from the other location when you're not at that location Financial management, so explain who will help to manage the money, which is mostly the host organisation. They may have a research finance office. It's always good if you can describe their experience of managing budgets, particularly research budgets. If you're going to do anything which may be commercialisable, you should explain the role of the technology transfer office or similar in any commercialisation efforts. You should also include, and this is specifically asked for, an estimate of the risks related to the research work and the project as well. Um, the overall fellowship and contingency plans. So if you had interconnected work packages, for example, that could possibly be a risk because if work package one doesn't work, maybe work package two is going to be won't work either and how you'll manage that. Your plan B essentially. Um, overall fellowship things, you know, maybe you plan to go to a particular conference and that particular conference is cancelled that year for some particular reason. Um, what would you do in that case? And those are the kind of risks that you should put in. In section 3.4, you need to talk about the infrastructure and institutional environment. So here you have to describe the main role of all the organisations involved in the fellowship and affirm their commitment to it. So this means your European host, be it academic or non-academic, the non-European host for global fellowship and the secondment host if you have a secondment. For global fellowship, you need to provide a letter of commitment from the non-European host. Um, we often get asked whether you should provide a letter of commitment from the secondment host or any other organisations that will be part of your application, maybe collaborators. Um, my advice is that if you think it would be beneficial to include a letter of commitment from the secondment host, that you should probably do so. Just make sure that the content of the letter matches what's written in the proposal. And this can be tricky because sometimes you get the letter relatively early on and then you change things as you move towards the deadline. So just make sure that there's no um, differences between what they say in the letter and what is written in the actual. So you can underline the commitment of these organisations by describing the research and training or hosting infrastructure that the host will provide in order to successfully implement the fellowship. So you can remind the evaluator that lists of different equipment or research infrastructures can be found in these tables in section 5 that I've mentioned a few times, the capacities tables. So you don't need to repeat the information, you can just tell the evaluators that a list of the research equipment can be found in the table. For infrastructure, you can also mention, in addition to the research infrastructure, um, other infrastructures like office space, lab space, access to library, IT facilities, uh, researcher or staff development programs, uh, human resources, finance offices, etc., international offices that might support your fellowship. You can outline the relocation assistance that will be on offer for you, uh, the Euraccess Ireland um, Researcher Mobility Portal and the Euraccess offices in other countries around Europe can help. Is there a new researcher orientation program, for example, you can do that. And you can make a link here also to section uh, 1.3 of the application, which talks about the integration in the new environment. If your organisation that you're going to has endorsed the charter and code or has the HR Excellence and Research logo, you can mention those details here. And don't forget to include the host for secondment if that's applicable. So the capacities tables are in section 5. You put in one per organisation, so for European Fellowship, one for the European host. For Global Fellowship, you add one for the, fellow, the host outside of Europe. And if you're doing a secondment in either European or Global Fellowship, you add one for the secondment host. You can put in a maximum of one page per organisation. So this is the information that they request. There is a general description and you could also mention here the HR logo and or the Athena Swan logo if your organisation has those awards. You mention the role and commitment of the key person, so the supervisor and any other persons, co-supervisors, co-mentors. You should put in something about the percentage time commitment of that person. You can put in a list of key research facilities, infrastructure and equipment relevant to the individual fellowship work that you'll do. The question about independent research premises for most organisations is simply answer yes, most organisations have their own premises. Um, however, say a small organisation which has spun out from an academic institution is maybe still using the R&D facilities of that academic institution. In that case, no, they don't have their own research premises and you can mention where those research premises are located. 
There's a section then on previous involvement in research and training programmes. So this can be EU funding programmes, it can be national funding programmes, it can be any um, even internal programmes where you have been involved in research activities. Current involvement is the same, it's just what's happening now. And then any relevant publications and or research or innovation products that's relevant to the research to be carried out in the individual fellowship you can provide a list of those there um, remember it's maximum one page and so if you go over the one page they will disregard any extra content above that one page last but not least the ethics section so all proposals will be checked but not scored for ethics issues so it won't form part of your 100 marks for your proposal um, if necessary, a separate ethical review will take place. There's a standard ethics table in the admin form. Now, you may be thinking to yourself, there's no ethics in my research. You'd be surprised what the Commission will label as ethics, so please check this form very carefully. If you indicate any of those ethics issues in that standard table, in the Part 6 of the Part B, you must describe in detail how those ethical issues will be managed, things about legal and ethical requirements, is there an ethics committee? Is there a data protection officer who will help with these things? If you're doing something that involves informed consent, provide copies of informed consent forms. And there's no page limit, so provide as much relevant information as possible. There is an ethics guide, which you can consult and which can help you to fill out this section. So the most important tip, and this comes from uh, someone I know who has evaluated for many years now for the European Commission for these fellowships, is answer the question that is asked. The proposal template is quite detailed and it asks for quite a lot and sometimes people leave out things they don't answer a particular question so make sure that you look at them quite carefully and you answer them correctly and you don't leave anything out so that's it for today's webinar i hope you have found it useful again if you've had any questions you can email them through to mercury at iua.ie it will take us a couple of days to get everything uploaded on the website but we'll publish a list of the questions and answers um, as I said, we have various different channels to keep in touch with us. Please feel free to join our LinkedIn group, to follow us on Twitter, um, or simply to sign up to our email distribution list, again by emailing marcurie at iua.ie. So thank you very much for your attention and best of luck with submitting your application.